Hello, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. It's a big pleasure to, to be here and, and have you here with us today. I'm Maria Antonia Tigre. I'm the Global Climate Litigation Fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. On behalf of the Sabin Center, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, we are thrilled to have you here to, to join us on our second webinar on, on the Sabin Center's monthly webinar series on climate litigation. So just a brief background for those of you who don't know, in December of last year, the Sabin Center launched a global network of peer review scholars on climate litigation. The network was created to fill uh, some gaps in the existing data on climate litigation in our database. As you know, the, the Sabin Center hosts a, a global database on climate cases, which we have maintained since 2011, along with collaborations with other partners. And with the extensive growth of climate litigation, we have decided to create a network as part of this, our ongoing partnership with the United Nations Environment Program as well. So the network includes rapporteurs in multiple jurisdictions who help us ensure that the database is comprehensive and up-to-date. And this collaboration with the rapporteurs has proven to be inc incredibly fruitful so far with several cases and updates being added to the database, uh, including in jurisdictions that we didn't have any cases before and especially for jurisdictions in the global south. So, um, as part of this collaboration with the network, we have launched a monthly webinar series to really shine a light uh, on climate litigation on countries or cases that we believe are crucial to understanding global trends right now. So the second webinar is focused on Argentina and we'll talk about some uh, uh, new emerging cases that are going on in, in Argentina specifically. So we are um, incredibly lucky to have with us today four speakers. So we have um, uh, Rafael Colombo and Lucas Micheluf, uh, who are lawyers from the Argentine Association of Environmental Lawyers and have brought uh, this claim that we're talking about against the state of Argentina. And then we have Mal Maria Valeria Berros and Gaston Medici Colombo, who are the national rapporteurs for Argentina for the Seven Center's peer review network on, climate, uh, on global climate litigation. So to start us off, I'll uh, ask Valeria to provide a brief overview of Argentina's climate legislation and most common judicial avenue for climate claims so we can understand a little bit about the context that we're talking about here. Well, thank you, Maria Antonia. Uh, well, it's, it's a great opportunity to be here and to share some ideas about the the climate change litigation in Argentina that is an emerging process, we can say. so. I will only introduce two very brief comments on two aspects about Argentinian legislation in order to provide a framework for the presentation of the case that will be done by Rafael and, and Lucas. Uh, one of the topics is the existing legislation on climate change in our country, and the other one uh, is the legal action that is the most commonly used in our country to sue environmental cases. We have some specific questions there too well, to, to notice to you, to understand a little bit more about how the environmental cases arrive to the tribunals in, in our country. Um, about the climate litigation legislation, uh, about climate change le legislation, sorry, it is important to point out that Argentina has a law on climate change adaptation and mitigation since December 2018. Uh, this law has a series of objectives linked to adaptation, to mitigation, and organize some specialized institutions. In fact, this law established the National Climate Change Cabinet and an advisory council on the topic. And it also provides for a national climate change adaptation and mitigation plan and creates a national information system. And the law has a series of minimum contents that must be taken into account into the plan. And it also provides for a public participation and access to information on climate, on climate change. And finally, it also established the elaboration of an annual report presenting the state of the country situation on the topic. But um, we can say that for two years and a few months until now, we have had this regulation on a, of a national scope, which is articulated with some local regulation because our country is a federal one. So, 
the province can also elaborate regulation on, on environmental matters and always taking into consideration the content of the national regulation that is called leyes de presupuestos mínimos is something that is established in our constitution and organize the competence about environmental regulation. So the law we have about climate change is one ley de presupuestos mínimos that established this uh, minimum content that uh, has to be taken into account into account by the provinces and the localities that have any kind of regulation on, on climate change. And the second topic is the one related with the main or the most commonly used uh, actions, legal actions to sue environmental cases. And in that, um, in that case, I want to figure out some, some ideas about um, the long history that we have in Argentina about the concept of collective interest and collective rights. We have a long history about this and it is, was a history made by judicial decisions, by law, but, and also it was introduced in our constitution, in our last constitutional reform. So the, and this idea established that individual persons, NGOs, group of people can bring environmental cases into justice. And it's the most commonly uh, action that you can find in our judicial decisions and the action that is normally taken into account to present these kind of cases into, into the different tribun tribunals around the country is the Amparo. We call the, this is the name of, a, of this collective action that is part of our constitutions and is also um, expressly recognized in the, in the actual, in the current version of, of our constitution as a guarantee against the violation of rights recognized by the constitution itself. And most environmental cases, including the emerging environmental uh, cases related with climate change are brought before the courts with this, uh, this judicial action, the Acción de Amparo, that is a constitutional action and open the possibility to groups, NGOs and individual persons to sue uh, in the different tribunals around, the, our, around our country. And this action was used in this case of the offshore oil exploitation that the lawyers, Rafael Colombo and Lucas Michelud will explain in, in a few moments. But before that, Gaston will explain a little bit more about how is the climate change litigation emerging in, in our country. Thank you so much, Valeria. Uh, so I should mention just the, that um, Gaston and Valeria will speak in English and then uh, Lucas and Rafael will speak in Spanish. So um, maybe Nicolas, if you wanna just translate that, my, uh, my Spanish is very bad. So I can't really speak in Spanish, but we'll, the, the cases will be translated. Yeah, uh, sí, los casos van a estar introducidos por Lucas y por Rafael, se van a presentar en español y luego yo, Nicolás, voy a hacer la interpretación al inglés. Yes, Nicolás, I should have introduced you. He's uh, our kind translator for, uh, for this webinar today, and I apologize. Um, so, Gaston, if you can provide a brief overview of um, Argentina's climate litigation landscape to continue with this background before we've moved to the cases. Of course. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Maria, for having me and for leading the, the organization of this event. Uh, as you mentioned, I will offer a brief overview of Argentina's climate litigation landscape, just to give a sense of what is going on in this jurisdiction. So I have to start saying that climate litigation in Argentina is in its infancy. Uh, contrary to what we are witnessing in other countries of the region, and uh, especially in, in Brazil, in Argentina, there are just a few very recent uh, cases that really pose undeveloped climate arguments. And there is not a single judicial decision, at least to my knowledge, in which climate grounds uh, are developed. On the Sabin Center database, uh, as you can see, there are 10 cases listed as climate litigation in, in Argentina. Uh, and other different cases are included 
in other databases as the AIDAS database on climate litigation in, in Latin America. Although these other cases, uh, or in these other cases, uh, climate concerns are not even mentioned or are just passing references. And that relates to the different methodological approach that the AIDAS database presents, also including cases that in general terms seek uh, for climate justice. From the 10 cases listed on the Summit Center database, uh, six are almost identical lawsuits before first instance federal courts against power plants located near Buenos Aires. The plaintiffs here are challenging the administrative consent of the power plants and the climate issue is in these cases only superficially mentioned uh, mainly to characterize the project as unsustainable initiatives. In the sense, a judicial decision on climate grounds in these cases is, uh, in my opinion, unlikely. Beyond these cases, there, are, there is one lawsuit uh, failed, filed by NGOs and children that challenges uh, directly before the Supreme Court the inaction of local and national governments in addressing uh, an environmental emergency derived from the continuous burning of crucial of a crucial uh, wetland ecosystem, uh, the Delta of the Parana River. Here, climate grounds uh, are more central, although not the main uh, focus of the lawsuit. The climate ground in this case is double. First, uh, the, burn, the burning of the wetland implies the emissions of a big amount of greenhouse gases um, to the atmospheres and at the same time implies the loss, the loss of a relevant carbon sink. And second, wetlands are crucial ecosystem for adaptation to climate change and should be especially uh, protected. Then the plaintiffs are asking for the immediate coordination and action of the different governments to stop the burning of the wetland. Three more cases are listed on the database, all related to the fossil fuel offshore exploration. One of course is the Greenpeace case that will be presented in a few minutes uh, by Lucas and Rafael. And the others uh, were uh, failed by um, a group of environmental NGOs and by the mayor of a coastal city near the exploration area. These cases also include climate arguments against the exploration, but they are less developed or less central than those in the Greenpeace case. None of these cases, these 10 cases, have a final decision by the court yet. Um, even though there have been some relevant uh, intermediate resolutions, mainly on injunctions relief, courts have not addressed in a meaningful, in a meaningful manner the climate arguments presented by the plaintiff. Maybe the most salient mention was in the injunction decision of the Delta case, with the Supreme Court highlighting the objectives of the national climate law uh, that commented Valeria as a relevant legal context of the case. That can give some hope of having a climate grounded final decision by the Supreme Court but um, let's see what happens. Uh, beyond these cases, the Supreme Court has made passing references to climate change in at least two other prominent environmental cases. In a 2017 judgment, in a case between two Argentinian provinces, in which the focus was uh, the minimum volume of water of a river than one province uh, that one province must guarantee to the other. And in a 2019 judgment, in a case in which the Barry Gold Corporation challenged the constitution constitutionality of the Glaciers Protection Law, alleging that it affected its gold mining activities in the Andean mountains. These developments, together with all that is happening in other Latin American countries, and specifically in Brazil, can allow for some grade of hope regarding what will happen in the Argentinian courts in the near future. 
So I will stop here to leave enough time for the explanation of what is going on uh, with the offshore cases, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gaston. And yes, if uh, anyone has questions, you can type it um, in the chat or in the Q&A uh, function and we'll, we'll attend them um, towards the end. So Rafael and Lucas, please, you can uh, move on and talk about the case. Good morning, everybody. Um, Pueden ver la presentación. No. Yes, ahí. Sí. There. Bueno, en primer lugar, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Thank you very much for the invitation. Voy a tratar de resumir brevemente el caso que estamos litigando ante la justicia de Mar del Plata en Argentina. Briefly share with you the case we are having at the federal court in Mar del Plata, Argentina. Como seguramente saben, en diciembre del año 2021, as you may know, in December 2021, el Ministerio de Ambiente de la Nación Argentina dictó una resolución que es la número 436-2021. The Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development issued Resolution 436 2021, aprobando una iniciativa offshore lideradas por las empresas Equinor, Shell e IPF. Approving an offshore uh, project led by the Norwegian company Equinor along with Shell and YPF. Esta última es una empresa nacional local cuyo control ha recuperado el Estado a partir del año 2012. The latter one is a national company taken by the state in 2012. La aprobación de este proyecto es la primera entre otras 11 solicitudes aún pendientes. This approval is the first among still pending 11 requests que involucran a, como mínimo, ocho corporaciones petroleras extranjeras. Which at least involve eight foreign petrol companies. British Petroleum, Exxon, Shell, entre otras. Sorry. A lo largo uh, de más de 220.000 kilómetros cuadrados de superficie marina. Yeah, they are covering over 220.000 square kilometers. Offshore. Desde la provincia de Buenos Aires hasta Tierra del Fuego, justo frente a la cuenca oeste de las Islas Malvinas. They cover the coast of the province of Buenos Aires up to Tierra del Fuego, opposite the western basin in the Malva Malvinas Islands. Respondiendo a esto, Greenpeace Argentina, junto a otras organizaciones de la sociedad civil de la costa atlántica argentina, responds Greenpeace Argentina along with other organizations from the civil society of the Argentine Atlantic Coast, presentaron una acción de amparo el 14 de enero del año 2022 ante la justicia federal de la ciudad de Mar del Plata. Files a constitutional collective action on January 14, 2022, at the Federal Justice of the Coastal City, Mar del Plata. Entre otros cuestionamientos, argumentaron que los proyectos profundizan el camino iniciado en 2013 con la explotación de hidrocarburos no convencionales vía fracking en Vaca Muerta. Among many other concerns, they have argued that these projects foster a path initiated in 2013 when non-conventional oil exploitation via fracking was approved in Vaca Muerta. Y ahora proponen expandir la frontera petrolera sobre el mar argentino, consolidando una matriz energética basada en la producción de combustible fósil. Now they want to expand the oil sphere over the Argentine Sea, establishing an energy system based on the production of fossil fuels. 
Pero volvamos ahora un poco más atrás en el tiempo. Let us back in time. Entre 2018 y 2019, el gobierno de Mauricio Macri licitó y adjudicó permisos de explotación hidrocarburífera en la plataforma continental argentina. During 2018 and 2019, under the presidency of Mauricio Macri, licenses for hydrocarbon exploration in the Argentinian continental shelf were tendered and allotted. Estamos hablando de 23 áreas que abarcan, como dijimos, 220.000 kilómetros de superficie frente a las costas de las provincias mencionadas. They are precisely 23 areas covering more than 220,000 square kilometers, as mentioned before, in the provinces. ¿Cuáles fueron las empresas beneficiadas de esta adjudicación? Which are the companies granted the allotment? 12 son corporaciones petroleras extranjeras. They are 12 Exxon foreign Mobil, petrol companies. ExxonMobil, Qatar Petroleum, British Petroleum, Total, Shell, Equinor, entre muchas otras. ExxonMobil, Qatar Petroleum, Plus Petrol, Equinor, Shell, among others. ¿Cuáles son los principales cuestionamientos que realizamos contra el procedimiento administrativo del proyecto impulsado por Equinor? What are the main arguments against this administrative process of the project boosted by Equinor along with YPF and Shell? Sin mencionar o dejando de lado el complejo constitucional, convencional y de derecho federal y provincial en materia de derechos humanos y ambientales, Apart from the constitutional, conventional, federal and provincial law, human and environmental law complexes, for example, the Convention on Diversity Biological, the Convention on the Rights of the Sea, the Convention on International Climate, among many other norms that protect species like the Ballena Franca Austral. For example, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Convention of the Law of the Sea, the international climate law, environmental and climate legislation of minimum budgets, and the law of protecting species such as the southern light whale, among many others. Podemos mencionar tres grandes cuestionamientos. We could mention three main arguments. El primero de ellos refiere a la exploración sísmica. The first refers to the sismic, sismic exploration. De acuerdo a Greenpeace Argentina, para encontrar petróleo en el mar, las petroleras llevan a cabo lo que se conoce como exploración sísmica. According to Greenpeace Argentina, in order to find oil under the sea, all companies must undergo a process called sismic exploration. Esto ya viene ocurriendo desde hace mucho tiempo en el mar argentino. This has been gone, going on since long ago in the Argentinian Sea. Básicamente, la exploración sísmica se lleva a cabo mediante disparos submarinos con cañones de aire. Basically, the seismic exploration is done by submarine vessel shoots with air cannons. Que provoca el impacto en más de 300.000 kilómetros cuadrados del mar y los del océano. Provoking an impact of more than 300,000 square kilometers under the sea. Se estima que hoy se está produciendo una explosión cada 10 segundos las 24 horas del día. It is now estimated that every 10 seconds there is an explosion all day long. Poniendo en riesgo toda la biodiversidad del mar argentino. Risking all the biodiversity in the Argentinian Sea. Imaginemos por un momento el volumen e impactos de este bombardeo ininterrumpido. Let us now think for a moment about the amount and impact of this permanent bombing. Que poseen una intensidad sonora comparable a las explosiones nucleares en Hiroshima o Nagasaki al final de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. It has an intense echo in as loud as the nuclear explosions in Hiroshima or Nagasaki by the end of the Second World War. El segundo riesgo surge de la perforación y extracción de petróleo. The second risk comes from the oil drilling and production. 
De acuerdo a investigaciones e informes elaborados por universidades públicas, According to research and reports by state-funded universities, la posibilidad de que ocurran derrames petroleros es extremadamente alta. The possibility of having these kinds of problems is extremely high. Esta conclusión surge tras el análisis de 50 años de datos estadísticos de la ocurrencia de derrames para diferentes niveles de producción offshore como es el caso que nos ocupa. This conclusion is carried out by analyzing statistics over 50 years of the frequency of oil spills to different offshore oil production levels, as is in this case. A la larga lista de accidentes, derrames, filtraciones, incendios, explosiones registradas por la industria, como la que recientemente ocurrió en el Golfo de México o frente a las costas de Perú, With the long list we have seen of these disasters, as in the oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico and, and over the coast um, beaches and the Sea of Peru. Consecuencias desastrosas de la industria offshore frente a las playas de Brasil. Devastating consequences of the offshore companies over the bridges in Brazil. Derrames in Thailand o frente a las costas de Nigeria. Oil spills in Thailand and in the coast of Nigeria. En la presentación, ahora podemos ver una simulación de lo que sería un derrame petrolero. We can see in the presentation the possible scenario of an oil spill in the Argentinian Sea. Ahora estamos viendo también parte de la campaña de Greenpeace Argentina en Playa Grande, en Mar del Plata, en diciembre de 2021. We are watching the Greenpeace campaign in the Mar del Plata Beach, December 2021. Yendo al último cuestionamiento, y quizás el que más nos interesa. The other argument, and um, maybe the one that is the most important here. El mismo está fundamentado en un estudio de la Universidad Nacional del Centro. It is based on a study of the National University of El Centro. Que analizó el impacto de las emisiones de nuestro país por la quema de combustible si se avanzara con la nueva explotación de hidrocarburos en el mar y la exportación de esos hidrocarburos. They have analyzed the emissions impact in our country caused by fossil fuels combustion if this new hydrocarbon production in the sea and its export happens. La facultad arribó a conclusiones contundentes. The School of Engineering has arrived at drastic conclusions. La totalidad de los proyectos propuestos sobre el mar argentino generarían una producción de 733.000 barriles por día en el año 2030. All projects presented over the Argentinian Sea would produce 733.000 barrels per day by 2030. Para un escenario de máxima, de acuerdo a este estudio, nuestro país sería responsable de la emisión de alrededor de 3.1 millones de toneladas de dióxido de carbono equivalente en ese mismo año. In the worst scenario, our country would be responsible for the emission of around 3.1 million tons of CO2 by that year. Ello claramente favorece el incumplimiento de las metas plasmadas en la última contribución nacional. This favors a failure to comply with the national contribution. que está por encima de los límites necesarios para lograr atenuar el aumento de la temperatura global al límite de 1.5 grados e incluso al de 2 grados. Which is way above the necessary limits to mitigate the increase of the global temperature limit of 1.5 degrees and even the 2 degrees. A continuación, para hablar sobre la ofensiva legal las acciones judiciales en curso, le cedo la palabra a Lucas Michelin. Next, 
I will hand in uh, the word to Lucas Michelou to, to present the legal strategy. ¿Qué tal? Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. ¿Me escuchan bien? Yes, we can hear you well. Good morning, everybody. Bien. Bueno, en primer lugar, eh, agradecer a los organizadores por esta invitación. Realmente es muy importante eh, para nosotros poder compartir este caso, esta acción en el Sabin Center. First, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to share our case with Sabin Center. It is an honor and pleasure to be here. Bueno, antes de comentarles muy brevemente el curso de, de, de las acciones que están en trámite, hacer una aclaración eh, muy breve. Soy parte del equipo legal de la Asociación Argentina, pero no intervine en la causa como abogado patrocinante, sino en representación de la Asociación Argentina de Abogados y Abogadas Ambientales. I would like first to mention something important. I am part of the legal team of the Argentine Association of Environmental Lawyers, but my part in this intervention was not as representing it as Rafael Colombo is, but as representing the association. Es decir, la asociación eh, fue un patrocinio legal, en este caso eh, con el doctor Rafael Colombo, pero además es parte actora dentro del proceso, dentro de la causa, conjuntamente con Sorfright, Asociación de Surf Argentinos, Patagonia Natural, Mar, Cula, IRT, Surfistas de Necochea, Asociación General Alvarado del Sur y Ecos del Mar. Es una acción de amparo en defensa del mar argentino. So the association provides legal counsel in non representation in this case, but it's also a stakeholder in this action, along with Greenpeace, Surfrider, uh, Surf Argentine Association, Patagonia Natural, Mar, Cura, Surfist of Necochea, the General Association of Alvarado del Sur, and Echoes from the Sea. Uh, it is a collective action against the uh, hydrocarbon offshore expansion in the Argentine Sea. Voy a comentarles ahora brevemente cuál ha sido la ofensiva, es decir, las causas judiciales que se encuentran actualmente en trámite. I will now comment the legal strategy and the list of the current judicial actions. Como les comentaba Rafael, luego de dictarse la resolución 436 del año 2021 del Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible de la Nación, que fue la que aprobó precisamente este proyecto, entre el 7 de enero y el 13 de enero del año 2022, se pusieron un total de cuatro acciones. After issuing the approving of the resolution 436 by the Ministry of uh, Environment and Sustainable Development approving this project, between the 7th and 13th of January 2022, four legal actions were filed. El 7 de enero se interpusieron dos acciones que se denominan en lo que son los, los autos Godoy Rubén Oscar contra Estado Nacional, contra el Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, sobre amparo ambiental, y organización de ambientalistas autoconvocados sobre amparo ley 16.986. En el 7 de enero de 2022, hubo dos lawsuits. Uh, first, Godoy Rubén Oscar versus the National State uh, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development about an environmental collective action. And the other one is uh, the uh, environmentalist organization about an avias corpus. Y por otro lado, el 13 de enero del año 2022, se interpusieron otras dos acciones. Montenegro Guillermo Tristán contra el Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sustentable sobre Amparo Ambiental y Fundación Greenpeace Argentina y otros sobre Amparo Ambiental. Esta última acción es precisamente la que interpusimos eh, y es en el marco de las cuatro acciones la que incorpora la dimensión climática, la que incorpora la problemática del clima dentro, de, eh, dentro del litigio. Um, on, the, on January 13th, 2022, there, was, uh, there were two more lawsuits, Montenegro y Shermo Tristan versus the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development about uh, an environmental collective action. And the other one, which is um, the one we are involved in 
which is uh, mentioned by Greenpeace, Argentina and others, uh, versus the Argentine state and others over an, env over an environmental collective action, uh, which this latter one includes the climate change arguments into the judicial process. Ahora les voy a comentar eh, cuál fue precisamente el rumbo de estas cuatro acciones, estos cuatro procesos judiciales, los que se interpusieron, como les decía, entre el 7 de enero y el 23 de marzo del año 2022. I am not going to explain the history of these judicial processes presented uh, from January the 7th and January 13th. Como primer eh, punto, el 7 de enero al 13 de enero, les decía, se interpusieron un total de cuatro acciones judiciales, cuestionando todas ellas la autorización emitida por el Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, autorizando el proyecto eh, que fue, como mencionaba Rafael, la resolución 436 del año 2021, sobre cuatro áreas, el CAN 108, el CAN 100 y el CAN 114. Todas estas acciones, las cuatro, se terminaron acumulando por conexidad, es decir, estamos hablando en definitiva de un solo proceso judicial. So, from the 7th and 13th January, four proceedings were filed, as I mentioned before. They questioned the project authorization issued by the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in resolution 436-21. Uh, approving this uh, offshore project in different areas, as in CAN 108, 100, and uh, CAN 114. Uh, due to the connection among the cases, they were all gathered in one, so we can now talk about only one case. El 14 de enero del 2022, <coughs> es decir, el día de la última acción judicial, el juez federal Martín se declara competente para entender en la causa iniciada por las distintas organizaciones ambientales. On January 14th, the federal judge uh, Martín declares his jurisdiction on the case initiated by the environmental organizations. El 11 de febrero del 2022, por resolución del juez federal Martín, y luego de haber anunciado eh, las causas interpuestas, es decir, el proceso judicial en sí, se otorga favorablemente la medida cautelar que habíamos solicitado, ordenando la inmediata suspensión del proyecto cuestionado y notifica a Equinor Sucursal Argentina que debe abstenerse de iniciar las tareas de exploración vinculadas y que están de algún modo relacionadas al proyecto de exploración hasta tanto se dicte sentencia definitiva. Yeah. On January 11th, 2022, the federal judge Martin orders an injunction to immediately halt the project and notifies Equino Argentina to stop the beginning of the exploration activities until there is a final judgment on the process. El 16 de febrero del 2022, el Estado Nacional apela la medida cautelar otorgada y recusa también al juez. En este caso, el juez Santiago Borse, que es quien había intervenido en esto, y solicita la declaración de incompetencia, exigiendo que la causa se tramite ante los juzgados federales con asiento en la Ciudad Autónoma de Buenos Aires. Uh, February 16th, uh, the National State files an appeal to the injunction order, and in addition, they ask for the removal of the charge from the case and demands the case to be processed before the federal courts in the autonomous city of Buenos Aires. El juez Santiago Bose Martín abre incidente de recusación, contesta la impugnación realizada por el Estado y por las empresas, negando que su accionar se encuadre dentro de las causales de recusación que prevé el Código Procesal Federal, Civil y Comercial, hasta tanto la Cámara Federal de Mar del Plata resuelva acerca de su continuidad o no frente al caso y gira, eleva el expediente hacia el juzgado federal número 4 a cargo del juez Alfredo López. So, en that same day, Santiago Borse Martín, the judge, files the recusation plea 
and also the process, the protest of the state and the companies, and refuses that his person does not fit any of the exceptions from the laws governing challenges in the federal procedural, civil, and commercial code. And until the federal court of Mar del Plata answers upon this challenge, gives the case to the federal court number four in charge of Alfredo López. El 17 de febrero se presenta Equinor y IPF de manera conjunta, apela a la medida cautelar otorgada, recusan al juez Martín y solicitan la declaración de incompetencia, exigiendo que la causa se tramite ante los tribunales federales con asiento en eh, la ciudad autónoma de Buenos Aires. The following day, on 17th February, Equinor and YPF they together appeal the injunction. They ask for the removal of uh, Judge Martin and his lack of jurisdiction, and they also demand the case to be processed before the federal courts in the autonomous city of Buenos Aires. El 18 de febrero ocurre algo realmente eh, eh, insólito, increíble. Something unusual happens on the February 18th. Alfredo López, el nuevo juez a cargo ahora de la causa, hace lugar a los argumentos presentados por el Estado Nacional y por las empresas, concede el recurso de apelación y suspende la vigencia de la medida cautelar. So Alfredo López, the new judge on the case, he accepts the demands of the national state and the old companies, allowing the appeal to proceed with suspensing effect so they could start working. El 7 de marzo del 2022, Greenpeace Argentina y organizaciones de la sociedad civil de la costa atlántica argentina contestan los escritos presentados por el Estado y por las empresas Equinor e IPF. On the March the 7th, Greenpeace Argentina and some other organizations of the civil society of the Argentinian Atlantic Coast, they fought back against the demands presented by the state and the companies. En términos generales, lo que solicitamos fue que se rechace los recursos de apelación presentados y que se ratifique el decisorio de fecha 11 de febrero del 2022, que les mencionaba antes, dictado por el Juzgado Federal número 2 de Mar del Plata, manteniendo, por lo tanto, la vigencia de la medida cautelar que había ordenado la inmediata suspensión de la aprobación de la campaña de adquisición sísmica eh, offshore eh, argentina en las cuencas que les había referido anteriormente, hasta tanto se dicta. By and large, they request to turn down the appeal presented and to ratify the decision mentioned before on February the 11th, sentenced by federal court number two in Mar del Plata, keeping the injunction to immediately hold the approval of the Argentine seismic offshore acquisition campaign in the Argentinian North Basin basins mentions before. El 21 de marzo sucede un hito realmente importante. Something really important happens on 21st March. El fiscal general ante la Cámara Federal emite un dictamen que si bien no es vinculante, rechaza la recusación planteada y solicita a la Cámara que mantenga la vigencia de la medida cautelar otorgada inicialmente por el juez Martín. The general attorney issues an unbinding resolution before the federal court in which he refuses the removal of the judge and demands to keep the injunction initially issued by Judge Martin. En un total de 33 páginas, el fiscal general se expresa favorablemente, además de lo solicitado por la Cámara, es decir, competencia y habilitación de instancia, de otras cuestiones sobre las cuales no se había inclusive preguntado. En este, eh, en, este, eh, en este dictamen, además, eh, refiere, por ejemplo, a la afectación de las especies marinas, al principio precautorio que establece nuestra Corte Suprema de Justicia de la Nación, al acuerdo de Escazú, al impacto económico sobre el desarrollo, entre otros conceptos y temas sustanciales dentro de la causa. The general attorney writes 33 pages expressing his in favor of what has been requested as the jurisdiction and the appeal, and other issues he was not requested for, such as the marine species affected, 
the precautionary principle of the Supreme Court of Argentina, the Escazú Agreement, and economic impact on the fishing market, among many other important concepts. Y el 23 de marzo del 2020, la Cámara Federal de Mar del Plata rechaza la recusación planteada contra el juez Martín y confirma al mencionado juez, ¿no? al juez que les decía anteriormente, eh, que es en definitiva eh, la confirmación lo que va a volver a ponerlo al juez Martín al, a cargo del proceso judicial. On March 23rd, the Federal Court of Mar del Plata refuses the removal of Judge Martin and confirms him to proceed with the case. So he is now in charge of the case. Bien, eh, resuelto de algún modo lo que es la recusación y la puesta nuevamente eh, en funcionamiento del juez Martín en el proceso judicial. So having solved the removal of the uh, Judge Martin in the case, el expediente, es decir, el proceso judicial se encuentra actualmente en despacho a resolución. The legal process is not waiting to be processed. Y aunque no tengamos fecha cierta, entendemos que es inminente que la Cámara resuelva sobre la cautelar. And despite the fact that we don't have a specific date, on the uh, in, in judgment. Es decir, sobre la cautelar dictada por el juez Martín, quien intervino en primera, en primera oportunidad dentro del proceso y quien tiene actualmente nuevamente el, el, eh, la, la causa. Uh, the, the, we are waiting for the courts to solve the injunction ordered by uh, Judge Martin in the case. Y estamos a la espera de esa resolución entendiendo eh, que la confirmación de la Cámara en el sentido que lo venimos proponiendo eh, las distintas organizaciones eh, tiene que estar orientada precisamente a eh, suspender las exploraciones sísmicas hasta tanto se dicte sentencia definitiva. So what we are waiting for is the decision of the federal court Um, to suspend and make the injunction to the hold of the seismic exploration until there is a final judgment on the case. Eh, en definitiva, para ir cerrando, eh, estamos esperando esta resolución de cámara y entendemos eh, es lo que venimos solicitando y, y requiriéndole nuevamente, en este caso, a la cámara que ratifique la cautelar y que por lo tanto quede nuevamente con efecto suspensivo la autorización otorgada por el Estado Nacional para avanzar con las exploraciones sísmicas en el mar argentino. So we are waiting for the judge to uh, confirm the injunction or in the sismic exploration um, on the offshore Argentine Sea. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias y quedamos también a disposición para preguntas y cualquier debate que se pueda generar. Thank you very much. Um, we are open to debate and questions. Muchas gracias, uh, Rafael y Lucas. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll ask one of the questions in English, if that's okay. Uh, and Nicolas can, can translate it. And uh, if anyone has questions, you can type it in the Q&A or the chat and we can go over those. Um, so I wanted to ask first, since there are so many uh, environmental arguments as well um, that are brought within those cases, um, and uh, what, what do you think are the chances that the court will focus uh, on the climate concerns specifically? Okay. Ya que hay varios argumentos con relación a lo ambiental, ¿cuáles creen que son las chances de que la Corte se enfoque en aquellos argumentos más climáticos? Bueno, desde mi punto de vista, muy pocas. From my point of view, very few. Básicamente porque hasta ahora, a pesar de que en nuestra demanda de más de 123 páginas hemos 
revisado una ex exhaustiva argumentación climática. Basically, that um, although our case uh, in 123 pages are uh, um, describing with um, scientific data all of these uh, climate arguments, ninguna de las resoluciones o decisiones tomadas hasta ahora, por ejemplo, la medida cautelar otorgada favorablemente, None of the resolutions until now, such as the injunction, injunction, se ha basado en argumentos climáticos. Are based on climate change arguments. Por el contrario, se basan en la columna vertebral del derecho ambiental argentino. On the other hand, they are based on the uh, spine of the environmental law in Argentina. Como por ejemplo, el principio precautorio, el principio preventivo, o el, el acuerdo de Escazú. As the precautionary principle and the preventive principle and the Escazú agreement. Do you think maybe you can talk a little bit more about that? Maybe Gaston and Valeria can also uh, weigh in. Because do you think it's because the courts are not very favorable to the climate argument, or is just because they're more used to the environmental, you know, the jurisprudence that there already exists on environmental cases? Creen que es por una cuestión de que los tribunales están acostumbrados a los argumentos más ambientales? ¿Es para mí la pregunta? No. Para todos también, le la... pregunta a Valeria y a Gastón. Gastón, Vale, Lucas, bueno. Pues sí, le cedo la palabra si quieren comentar algo. Ok, I, I can start. Uh, well, it's just my impression um, that um, Argentinian courts are very used to deal with environmental issues, but not uh, climate change. So uh, tools or grounds as the precautionary principle, um, preventive principle or procedural rights are, um, are uh, tools that uh, are easy for the court to, to, to use. And probably they don't know too much about all the climate arguments developed in other jurisdictions. So um, when when plaintiffs are um, are uh, alleging that, for example, that the the project uh, is uh, in contradiction with the NDC for a federal judge, uh, this is maybe a little bit strange. Oh, sorry, Nicolas. I can uh, repeat. Uh, no, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Sorry, but I, I was seeing that Lucas um, probably understood. Yeah. <laughs> so. Complemento con algo. Eh, un minuto. Y tiene que ver un poco con esto que mencionaba también Gastón, ¿no? Eh, hay toda una tradición en. en En, en el derecho argentino, pero sobre todo en el derecho vivo, en el que se construye en los tribunales, y está más ligado a resolver los grandes conflictos ambientales o socioambientales desde la lógica, fundamentalmente, de instrumentos de política y gestión ambiental, entre ellos los conflictos ambientales, pero no hay experiencias eh, de litigios eh, eh, climáticos que vayan también generando... ¿no? Una, una doctrina eh, judicial. Por lo tanto, si esa doctrina judicial no está en nuestro superior tribunal, que es la Corte Suprema, mucho menos ¿no? o de menor forma propaga hacia los tribunales inferiores. Okay, so there is a high tradition in the Argentine law, as was mentioned in Gaston, which is uh, connected to uh, environmental conflicts. Um, well, which are based also in environmental policies. Uh, however, there is no experience in climate change arguments or in climate change cases 
uh, not even in the Supreme Court, which could then give the um, grounds or the main grounds to the uh, lower courts. Um, so there is no doctrine uh, about these arguments. I only want to add only a few words. I think that something important to take into account too is that the climate change uh, discussion is also merging for scholars. So when you look at the Journal of Environmental Law here in Argentina, you cannot find many things about climate change or maybe you can find some small comments on the national law or on some specific regulation in any province or in any small uh, uh, local, locality or city in, in our country. So that is like an emerging process into, into the academia too. It's very interesting, um, mostly because I well, I'll talk slowly so Nicolas can translate it. Uh, but because I'm from Brazil, so I obviously follow um, what's going on in Brazil. And until a couple of years ago, we also didn't have a lot of climate, specifically climate litigation cases. Um, but we're seeing a shift in that recently. And I wanted to explain a little bit to see maybe if we can compare, but I'll let Nicolas translate in. Sure, yes. Since I'm, uh, so, perdón. Eh, como soy de Brasil, y eh, también sigo mucho lo que está sucediendo allí en Brasil, eh, y hace unos años tampoco teníamos una historia en relación al cambio climático y las litigaciones, pero eh, sí hubo un cambio, <coughs> sorry, pero sí ha, un, ha habido un cambio ahora, que me gustaría poder compartirlo así podemos también comparar con el caso argentino. Because I think, well, we obviously have a lot of environmental litigation too, so a big tradition on, on that. Um, and I, I think the other day I heard there are 4,000 cases related to deforestation in the Amazon rainforest alone, so environmental cases. And now last week we just uh, had the first case that has been being heard by the Supreme Court in Brazil and they're um, really focusing on the climate argument uh, and I think one of the reasons, and now we have over 30 cases actually um, in climate litigation. And I think part of the reason is there is political, right? So the, obviously the Brazilian government has been very, you know, um, has been doing a lot of regression and, and climate change has been worsening a lot because of that. Sí. Um, de que, bueno, ha habido una muy gran tradición últimamente. Eh, que ha contado más de 40 casos, más de 40 mil casos en relación a cuestiones ambientales y que la semana pasada la Corte Suprema de Brasil ha empezado a tratar eh, casos en relación al cambio climático, uno de ellos, eh, y que ahora hay más de 30 casos y creo que una de las razones, o las razones más que nada política, ya que el gobierno de Brasil ha demostrado una gran regresión en este sentido. And uh, so the, the case that was being heard, I don't know how much people have been following it, but the justices, justice of the Supreme Court who is giving the vote, she gave half of her vote already and we'll hear the rest of it tomorrow, tomorrow actually. But she has been argued a lot on, you know, the climate effects of deforestation in the Amazon rainforest and how these effects are global, but also linking that to the to the political problems too, in the way that the Brazilian administration is being handled. El caso de ahora, que justo está sucediendo, desde ayer y ahora ya han votado la mitad de la corte eh, y han argumentado sobre las cuestiones en relación a la deforestación y los, las consecuencias en el cambio climático. Eh, y bueno, estamos esperando a los demás votos en el día de hoy. So just to conclude, we don't, obviously we don't know the rest yet, but it sounds like her vote was, is going to be very, um, you know, pro-plaintiff and will be very positive uh, from a climate angle. But I was wondering, so that will potentially be the one, one of the biggest, you know, first biggest case, climate case in Latin America. So do you think that could have an effect from a comparative perspective in Argentina? 
para finalizar, ya que eh, posiblemente los votos sean mayormente positivos a favor de los argumentos sobre el cambio climático, ¿ustedes creen que esto podría tener alguna repercusión en, los, en este caso? Sí, por supuesto. Cualquier hecho o hito político judicial en América Latina puede llegar a tener repercusión en nuestro país. Vemos que algo parecido está ocurriendo en Chile con el debate, por ejemplo, en relación a otro tema sobre derechos de la naturaleza. Sí, yeah, sure. any political or environmental case uh, in the region is going to cause Uh, an effect on the case, as we can also see it in Chile with the debate over the um, rights of nature in the Constitution. Sin embargo, desde mi punto de vista, creo que a veces no tenemos que otorgarle una dimensión tan excluyente a las decisiones judiciales. However, as I see it, we don't have to give Um, this um, exclusive part to the different cases as we hear it. También son muy relevantes los activismos dirigidos hacia las innovaciones legislativas y la exigibilidad de políticas públicas climáticas eh, por parte de los poderes ejecutivos o administrativos. Activism in order to change the different policies of the government is also a very important or play a, a key role in these kinds of cases to change the different policies. There is a question. Would you like me to read it? Yeah, there is a question. Oh, sorry, yes, Lucas. Rafael. Eh, entiendo las experiencias institucionales y judiciales de la región, puntualmente del Cono Sur. Yes, as complementary to Rafael was saying, uh, the experiences and the, of the institutions in the Global South. Pueden incidir positivamente en la resolución de conflictos como en el caso. They can also affect in the resolution of this conflict, as, in, as it is in this case. Pero no de manera independiente o autónoma a lo que estén resolviendo las cortes latinoamericanas. But not as an autom uh, autonomous uh, impact of what uh, the Latin American courts are working on. Sino en la medida de cómo están interpretando es cortes instrumentos que también han sido ratificados y firmados por el Estado argentino, como por ejemplo el Acuerdo de París, la Convención de Biodiversidad. But as how they are interpreting the different instrument, legal instruments that uh, the Argentine state has uh, signed as the Paris Agreement or the Convention on Biodiversity. Es decir, podría reforzar los argumentos de una Sorry, ¿quieres repetir lo que se me perdió? Podría reforzar los argumentos de una sentencia como eh, regla de interpretación de acuerdos que son vinculantes para el Estado argentino y que han sido puestos expresamente en consideración en la acción contra las petroleras del mar argentino. So they could be used as an argument, as a rule argument for the different uh, agreements that the Argentine government has legally binded to, uh, to be used in these kind of cases, in this particular case. And on that note, there is a, oh. There is a question. There is yes. a question, sorry, in, from Catalina Vallejo. It's about, mm -hmm. she asked about um, if, we, if we quote in our lawsuit documents or judicial decisions about climate change um, from other countries of the world. Yes, include uh, some decisions. Uh, and those decisions, uh, sorry, I told you in English, but <laughs> uh, my mistake. Uh, perdón, volvamos, Nico. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, dis disculpen. 
Eh, sí, incluimos decisiones judiciales, eh, pero lo incluimos de una manera estratégica, utilizando precisamente las categorías establecidas en el documento elaborado por las Naciones Unidas y el Sabin Center sobre el litigio climático. Yes, we did have include them, but using them uh, with the specific categories developed by the United Nations and the Southern Center. Como ustedes saben, en ese documento se establecen, eh, si mal no recuerdo, cuatro o cinco tendencias, y la nuestra es precisamente aquella tendencia que se inscribe sobre el impacto de la extracción de recursos y su vínculo con el cambio climático. So as you may know, there are four or five different categories defined by the center, and our case um, re relates to the first two, uh, the one of the impact of the resources on the climate change. Por supuesto, también hicimos referencia a casos que forman parte de otras tendencias, como el antecedente de Colombia, o Urgenda, o Juliana, pero fundamentalmente nos concentramos Yeah, we have also referred to different cases uh, as the ones in Colombia, Urgenda, or Juliana, but we have also concentrated on El caso de Greenpeace en Noruega contra el Ministerio de Petróleo y Energía. The case of Greenpeace in Norway against the Ministry of Petrol and Energy. Donde tenemos muchos puntos en común, como por ejemplo Where there are many points in common, such as la simetría entre el planteo climático estricto yeah, relativo symmetry. al incremento de emisiones e incumplimiento de la legislación ambiental y climática. The asymmetry of the climate uh, strict. Um, sorry, Rafa, can you repeat that? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Des, eh, la simetría entre el planteo climático estricto sobre el incremento de emisiones. Yeah, the asymmetry of the um, climate uh, arguments straight over the emissions. Y el incumplimiento de la legislación ambiental y climática. And the failure to comply the uh, climate uh, argument. Argumentos sobre un territorio sensible como es el océano que brinda I mean, importantes recursos ecosistémicos. Uh, Um, arguments important as the uh, relevance of the uh, sensibility of the uh, delicate uh, space of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Y además hay otros puntos en común. El demandado es el Estado y también se responsabiliza a las empresas. There are some other points in common because the, uh, we are fighting against the state and other companies. En cuanto a las fuentes jurídicas, recurrimos, como ya dijimos, al complejo constitucional, convencional y federal en materia de derechos ambientales y humanos. In the legal sources, we have uh, mentioned the constitutional, provincial and national complexes. La acción es interpuesta por, de manera colectiva por un conjunto de organizaciones de distintos puntos del país, pero fundamentalmente territorializadas en la ciudad de Mar del Plata. It is also a collective class action with different organization of the country, but mainly from the city of Mar del Plata. Y finalmente, la justicia federal de Mar del Plata es la que se ha declarado competente para intervenir en este caso. And finally, the courts of Mar del Plata are the ones that have uh, confirmed their jurisdiction. Para cerrar, hay una tensión en los usos de las fuentes jurídicas utilizadas para construir una teoría del caso. To conclude, there is a tension in these traditions to uh, um, find a, or perform a theory of the case. Debido a la enorme diversidad de argumentos a los que podemos recurrir. Because of the uh, wide variety of arguments we can allege. Este es un caso en donde la argumentación climática es muy poderosa. This is a case where the climate change argument is really powerful. Pero convive también con otros argumentos igualmente relevantes y que no podemos excluir del proceso de litigación. 
but it is along some other arguments which we cannot omit in the process of litigation. En vistas a también generar una fusión híbrida entre derechos humanos y ambiente. So we can find a hybrid fusion between human rights and environment. Thank you. This is very helpful, and it's it's really great to see how you're using the UNEP report to um, to make the case because I'm actually writing the update right now. So it's great that I'll be able to add that in at this case, and then I'll make sure to make the comparison with the Norway case because I think that's a perfect way to frame it in global south and global north and how how the lessons are being learned. It's a very important work. I love that report. Yeah, oh, great. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, all right, wonderful. So thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, really appreciate it. Hopefully, you know, when once we have a decision, when we can make this again uh, and talk about that, hopefully a very positive decision. And I'm um, very much looking forward to following the case and the updates. And thank you everyone involved. And thank you, Nicolas, for your incredible translation <laughs> uh, and for uh, Valeria and Gaston for organizing this and, and Lucas and Rafael for sharing uh, all your knowledge. And thank you. See you soon. Thank, thank you very much, much. Thank you. Maria Antonia. Saludos. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias eh, a todos, Maria Antonia, Vale, Gaston, Nicolás. Eh. Bye bye. Bye. Gracias. Thank you very much. Gracias. Bye.